Thank you for taking the time to join in with Uncommon Women Podcast, a dope podcast to bring light to reality from real life people sharing real life stories with a host of women having real life talk, the good and the bad with no judgment. Uncommon Women's Loyalty is here to support those that need a safe space to speak their truth and rawness to the world. Tune in, relax, take notes, and let's vibe. Here are your hosts, Uncommon Women. Good evening, everyone, and we are Uncommon Women. I am Jenny Lee. I am your host, Tyra, also known as the Go Guru. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And we have an amazing guest speaker this evening by the name of Noel Peterson, who's going to share how she birthed with a purpose to help other mid midwife women find their truth. But, be but before getting into that, she's going to share her story of having a life saving surgery. Hi, Noel. Hi, Noel. Hey everybody. Hello. It is an honor to have you this evening. And before we go into any details uh, about your life, uh, can you tell us how your life was growing up? Yeah, growing up, I felt like I was just an every everyday, ordinary little girl. Um, nothing special. <laughs> I didn't feel like there was anything good or different. I was the oldest of four kids. <coughs> Excuse me. And... I uh, went to, I did go to a Christian school for the first few years, but then public schools and big sister was it for life, um, became yeah. a teenager <laughs> and uh, turned into what my parents probably called the black sheep of the family and wanted to grow up faster than they were ready for. Wow. I actually was married at 17, separated at 18, divorced at 19 and remarried at 20. Wow. 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 So... And you said like you didn't really have much growing up. Like being the oldest, did you have a lot of responsibilities or like? I mean, I I feel like it was normal. It was um, I my parents both worked full time. My dad actually worked three jobs at one point. So you know, growing up was um, what you do and be with. I spent time with grandparents probably more than I can remember. Um, and I I was around. I went to school. I. I don't think I did much after school activities. I was a straight A student most of the time, um, but then taking care of the kids and uh, making sure the house was clean when you know people came over and um, supporting the family and, and taking care of the brothers and sisters. Cause I was, um, there was 10 years between me and the youngest. Hmm. Hmm, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're definitely in charge. <laughs> Definitely want to be in control. That definitely does fit the bill and you know, be the oldest and, and woman and it all just that's who we are. Yeah. Yeah. So can you get into details of your daily, daily life and how after your marriage and, you know, going through midlife, being a midlife crisis and being a midlife wife? How did that all come about? So I was a pastor's wife for 10 years. We raised our kids in Latin America. Um, and then my husband was a pastor, so missionary wife for 10 years. And then my husband was a pastor for 10 years. So we were in ministry for over 20 years, um, raised our kids in, in Latin America and then in Denver, Colorado. And wow. it, uh, life for us was, you know, it was different than, you know, working cause the kids that were, we pulled the kids out of school to go on mission trips often. Oh, and okay. that, for us, that was a big part of life is getting to see the world and getting to see, um, the different societies. Uh, one of our stories we have is my daughter, when she was little, she wanted, um, she was hanging out with dad on uh, a group that came to visit us when we were in Columbia, when she was, gosh, probably 10 or 12, maybe, maybe even younger than 10. Um, and she wanted to stay with the family that they were helping when the group came down to Columbia. And so we're talking lower class living in the slums slums of Bogota and she wanted to stay the night so she spent the night with a family of four kids and a mom in a shack with two twin beds and a tin roof wow and she that must have been a blast. wow and how old was she again I want to say nine or ten wow wow that must have been an amazing experience yeah. for her yeah 
Yeah. Aww. So I mean, that, so that's the life my kids grew up in and, you know, getting to yeah. see the world from a different perspective and, and they didn't know any different. That was just life for them. And, you know, yes, we had, you know, we lived middle class and we worked in the lower class, but that's, um, and she just loves people. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, for how long did you do the missionary work? So we were, we were down there for 10 years. We spent a year in Costa Rica learning Spanish and then nine years, um, my husband was a church planner and I worked in a international school as a teacher and principal. Wow. wow that's impressive. That's amazing. Um, can you speak on your journey and any of the op obstacles that you encountered throughout uh, anything that you went when you were going through your missionary trips and, you know, teaching and um, to the point where you started to, go into being a midlife wife? Uh, I spent you know, my 20 plus years doing what needed done. So I was Robert's wife. I was Nikhil's mom. I was Russell's mom. I never took the time. I never felt like I, it, it never came, occurred to me to consider what does Noel want? What is mm -hmm. Noel good at? Okay. What should I be doing? I took every job as it came along um, at the school, at the church, and prior to that, and even afterwards, every job that I did was something that fell in my lap. It was something that needed done. It was never an evaluation of, is this right for me? It was like, well, I can do that. Sure, let's go. Yeah. So, so for yeah, me, it cool. was, I was just going through the motions. I just lived life. Everything was fine. I mean, we have our ups and downs, right? No matter what we do, but I never evaluated my identity. Hmm. So my midlife crisis is trying to figure out who I am um, yeah. at, at age 40 and at age 50 is basically, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because I hadn't figured it wow. out yet. Wow. That, that kind of makes me think I'm 40 years old. <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> what are the first like couple signs of midlife like that how do you know exactly because i feel like that term is abuse people say that all the time almost now as a joke like i'm going through a midlife crisis so it's like when do you know that this is legitimate midlife and for me it's your identity and figuring out who you are and what you want to do so for okay. me back when i was turning 40 i was going through a job change and my kids were teenagers. They didn't necessarily need me as much as when they were little. I was not able to and didn't need to be a stay-at-home mom anymore. The kids were old enough to take care of themselves. So transitioning into a mom of teenagers and going through a job change was kind of like, what do I want to do? Yeah, I would wow. want to go and look for jobs. And I could look for any job because... I, it was open. I had time to look. I yeah. didn't know what I wanted to do. Wow. And I didn't find it then. I actually sent my resume out shotgun style and took the first one that offered. Wow. So you were just like, well, I need a job. <laughs> I need to do something. Does it, So it doesn't necessarily have an age attached to the label. I don't think so. I think the identity crisis that I work with women on is when we're changing our roles because we spend so much time yeah. identifying ourselves by what we do. That mm. when, yes. when we get a so moment to think of who we are, mm. it's like, well, well, wait, who am I? Yeah. Because we, we, become, we turn to be moms, we become wives, mm -hmm. we become employees. We become single again sometimes. Yeah, you know, we have yeah. deaths or divorces or things happen with our kids. Our kids move through skate stages. And if we're not prepared in who we are and what we're doing in the rest of our life, it really we can really struggle with those changes that our kids go through when mm -hmm. they go become teenagers, when they go off to college, when they move out of the house. Yeah. It's a change in our role in a way because we're still a mom, but they don't need us in the same way. I talk about mm -hmm. moving from enforcer to influencer over the years mm -hmm. because it, you know, we start okay. off enforcing the rules and they need those rules and those guidelines and those systems and structure. But when they get into teen years, they still need structure. They still need guide rails, but they really need to be influenced because they don't necessarily want to listen anymore. 
and yes, women. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with that. I think like everything you're just speaking is kind of speaking to me in a way. Because <laughs> like with my kids, my kids are older now. So it's like, even when I try to talk to the, you know, I talk to my son, it's like, you know, it's like, I want him to listen, but he's not going to listen type thing. He's, it's he's like, not obligated. yeah, he's not obligated, yeah. you know, but it's just like, I'm trying to help you here because I don't want you to go through that. You know, I know our children have to have their own experiences as well. But sometimes I feel like it's, I mean, we all were there. I mean, we, I guess when we were young, we didn't listen as much either, but it's different when we're a parent. Now we see things from the opposite side. So I totally get that. Um, and my, another thing for you is being, being a midlife wife, how, how was it when the kids actually left and you became an empty nester? How how did that come about? What were you going through? How did that make you feel? <laughs> I I struggled, but my situation was a little different because I became a grandma first. And oh, my grandson nice. lived with us for four years. So I got to enjoy helping with the grandchild and seeing his beautiful smile and fun, loving face Aww. every day. And so when my daughter moved out, I lost the grandson and my daughter. Yeah, oh, double so, yeah, so, so it's hard. And then six months later, I lost my son moved out as well. And so wow. it, it was it's some some struggle. And I was I had a job, full time job that I enjoyed, but I was working at home. So I was able to be there for them as I needed to. I could still babysit and have them around because they were still close enough. Okay. But once my son moved out, it was a realization that the house is empty. Yeah. The kids, but the and kids this is a tricky more than when they were home. Mm. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> so we, we talk to the kids more now than we ever did when they were teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but the tricky part is, yeah, you feel kind of obligated when they're at home to give them your all. You're, you almost would feel selfish to, like prior to the midlife, it's kind of like you almost need that moment of realization, like, okay, I need my own life and that assignment is done. You know, because if you had your grand, you, was that your grandson you said? Mm -hmm. If you had your grandson, I can't see you just leaving him to go do a hobby, you know? So but they he, needed you at that point. Yeah. And you, you evaluate things and you're around for the grandkids. The kids yeah. don't need you anymore. <laughs> yeah. If they're here, they don't need you anymore. And so they almost have to schedule time, say, I need to talk to you. You know, can you be yeah. here mm -hmm. tomorrow? It is. Yeah. We've actually yeah. learned to grow and love the flexibility and the spontaneity of being able to jump and go somewhere. So we, we um we like to go on little trips and we'll go driving or go to the mountains for the weekend or go to a race out in the south um and whatever and so going on little trips is my is kind of my saving grace because i get away and i get to to break away and and we can just Good. jump and go because Good. we don't have we don't have anything tying us down yep, yep. let's go Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you gotta start looking at the upside of things. Mm -hmm. right. I and also Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, like, you definitely have to look at the bright side and think of things. Mm -hmm. And if you've worked through the teen years so that you can have that relationship with the kid as adult, kids as adult, mm -hmm. it's it's more glorifying. It's more about it valuable. Yeah. And it when is. they come to you wanting your advice, it's all worth it. Yeah. Yes, it <laughs> is. I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. I am to want to experience that with my own children. So I totally agree with yeah. that. And I feel like I like, I had a better relationship with my parents as adults. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, like when I need advice, I this is, and I'm coming to you, this is genuine <laughs> and I value it. When you're young, you don't. You don't. And I mean, it's some, as parents, right? As parents, <laughs> you have to understand that they need to grow up they need yeah. to leave the nest it is the normal flow of things and when they make mistakes after they're adults it's not our fault yep. it's not. Yep. <laughs> it's on them. and they have to mm -hmm. learn from that we 
we had some times and uh, we just were there for our kids and loved on them. And you're struggling. You're not, you're not doing what I would want you to do, but I'm still going to love you. And I'm still going to be here. And when it's all said and done, you come back and we'll have a great Christmas or whatever's going on. Yeah. It'll be good. Okay. I want to go back to you being a grandma. I was okay. told that being a grandma is a different type of love. Can you like, I hear different points, but I would love to hear yours and how you feel about it and what you experience being a grandma. Um, because everyone says different things differently. And I would definitely love to hear your input. My husband likes to say we're trying to, it's our, our new stream of income. We're trying to bottle <laughs> or figure out how to be grandparents without being parents. Yeah. Mm, okay, it is I like so that. much fun. It is yeah. so, Aww. it's so good because you get all the joy and they actually, I mean, our kid, the grandkids will misbehave, but they don't misbehave much with grandma and grandpa. Hmm. We've okay. we got, the, we got the structure in place. We've, we've done this before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have, we can let them get away with things from time to time. Sure. They, but we've had our two grandkids live with us for the last four months because their parents are buying a house and yeah, it, mm. there's times it's, it's a little much, but we have our own room. Bye. See ya. You gotta go see mom. <laughs> yeah. And we, can, and we can still pick up and leave because yeah. Yeah. we can still go out to dinner and just disappear and it's okay. Yeah. That's very it, true. It's, yeah. Grandparenting is amazing. Look. It's parenting, but like glorified. It's yeah. fun. <laughs> you're older. You're more more mature. You know how life works, and you know yeah. how to get. You know the structure and things that are necessary, but yeah. you also can just walk away. You know, not necessarily yeah. in the middle of something, but you can schedule it and say, "Okay, you know, you're done. You can go back to mom and dad now." Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's like. Come here, ooh, 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 give it back. <laughs> but in and, a good, and, loving way. Yeah. <laughs> the smiles that they give you, I will tell you when my when my grandson first moved out, he was four. And I was what I was really struggling. And that uh, was when, when I was realizing that it was the grandparenting that I was missing and the emptiness wasn't as difficult because we they did them oh. she did them backwards. Um, but yeah. we went over to their house. And he turned off the TV, jumped out of his seat and came running up to grandma and grandpa and gave us hugs. And was, I'm like, okay, now it's all worth it. It's all good. Yeah. Aww. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh so um, after your midlife crisis and everything that you've been through, uh, let, can you speak on detail on your, your surgery? Yeah. So I was 48. I was healthy. I was not under doctor's care for anything. I was not being watched for anything. And I went mm. to work one day and a couple hours in, I got a sharp pain as if like I had a little pin or a little knife go right in my neck and in my chest. No mm. idea what it was. No clue. I ended up in open heart surgery and 13 days in the hospital in ICU and cardiac care. Wow. Um, it was called an aortic dissection, which Whoa. is the, the aorta, the big, huge tube coming out of your heart, going into the rest of your body. Yeah. Come, it kind of had come apart. So it, it has layers and the blood was flowing in, in the middle of the layers, which ca can cause aneurysm. So what oh you want to hear is those aneurysms bursting and people dying of an aortic aneurysm. Yeah. Wow. But I happened to be in the right place, got to the doctor quick enough into a right hospital where they knew they ended up finding it and discovering it and um, had a fabulous doctor on staff. And so it, it, it could be considered a near death experience because if they had not recovered it and had the right doctor on staff, I would have passed away. Wow. But I, I feel it, I call it a life-saving surgery because that's what I saw. I felt a surgery. I did not feel like I was near death because I went, I went in wow. with this pain and discomfort and I came out of surgery, not a hundred percent because I ended up having a second procedure, 
Okay. But I was better and I was still here. Yeah. Wow. Um, I my don't think I saw. Yeah. I think if you would have went home that day, that would have been very dangerous. Right. So um, Lucille Ball, John Ritter, um, the announcer from the World Cup who passed away, those were all the same issue. And when, wow. we, yeah. when we finally Googled it, it is a 40% mortality rate where 40% of them are discovered on autopsy because wow. they're not discovered. Because all it was was this little pain. It wasn't anything major. I had no history of heart problems and my heart is fine. Mm -hmm. All the heart diagnoses tests were fine. Wow. I had to do a cat just, scan. It just came out of nowhere. That is just so strange. Okay. Can they even explain how that just happens or it just happens? It just happens. And it, it I did genetic testing and they all came back normal. Wow. wow. So there is no, there's not even anything I can tell my kids to watch for. It's I was going to ask you, you seem like yeah. I kind of weird to assume, but you, I feel like you have good judgment. You're pretty healthy. Like, so, you know, that's kind of insane. Yeah. yeah. It, it's for really strange. Just, yeah. For something to just happen out of nowhere, you're like, you're living your life and you're coming out with this pain. So did this occur when you were going through your midlife crisis yes. at the time? I didn't realize it. I was working a full-time job and I liked my job and I liked the staff that I led. I was struggling with my supervisor, um, okay. but I, I wasn't feeling that there was anything pressing that I needed to be doing. Uh, so this was August, end of the year, you know, talk January. So we're talking four or five months later, I was feeling like I needed something else. I was feeling like there was what's next. What should my new year's resolution be? What should I work on this year? And I, I was actually sitting at the table with my husband. I was working on some worksheets that he had found for me online, trying to figure some of this stuff out. And he'd been an entrepreneur for about four years already, three years, three and a half years. And we'd, we've read entrepreneur books and trying to figure those things out. So I was working through these worksheets and I just got so frustrated. And for me, it, I'm a, I'm kind of an OCD person and, the font was light, the, there are spelling errors. It wasn't structure. It wasn't stapled. I mean, it was just the, some of the little things. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and said, then write your own. Mm. Oh, mm. That's an option. oh, what would that look like? So I spent the next few weekends drafting these worksheets to put this, these, this, questions and these um, questionnaires and evaluations and these tools and these questions together in an order that made sense to me. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. Here it is. Now what do I do? What do I do with it? I, I had no yeah. idea. It was, it was just these things I put together. My husband had written a book at the time and we were meeting with a publisher a few weeks later and showed it to him. And he's like, well, let me make it a book and print it. I'm like, yeah, okay. So now I have a book. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, I no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. It's kind it, of it, weird. It's like your diagnosis pushed you to like change lives. Oh, yeah. In and so, years. Yeah, very much so. It was very much something my husband says we need to take advantage of every day we have. We don't know how many are left. Um, mm. It's just a, a reminder to everybody that life is short. We don't know yeah. when God's going to take us home. Yeah. No, he, no, no, we do not know at all. And a while this whole situation pushed you into, you know, doing your book and helping women, what has it helped you along the, along, along the way as well? How did it help you along the way? I meant. Yeah. I, um, so I spent six months recovering. So a, a total of six months of medical adjust, uh, medicine adjustment because now i'm on high blood on blood pressure pills okay that's how my body reacted after all was done um yeah. and they only they only modify blood pressure meds every like two weeks so is modify it a little bit and wait two weeks okay. modify it a little bit and wait two weeks so it took me four months total to get my blood pressure under control wow, wow. which i had 12 weeks of no physical activity so I, I was not allowed to do chores, vacuuming, sweeping, dishes, nothing. And then another month of still adjusting the meds. 
and there was just a so I, I sat around a lot and so when i finally got my blood pressure down my brain could comprehend and process things i went back to work and it just wasn't okay. the same life oh. life wasn't the same work wasn't the same i i still could do my job i still enjoyed my job but i didn't have the fulfillment and the gumption to just go overboard like i had been for the last eight and a half years and mm-hmm. it was you know, processing through that and really why, what's, what's the difference and writing the book and starting to write a blog, like I need to write more. Mm. I love writing. And so my realization that in writing out my story and writing out what happened to me in the hospital, realizing that I thought I had an ordinary life which to me was ordinary because that's how, what I knew, right? Everything yeah. thinks, but it feels ordinary, <laughs> but nobody else had the circumstances of 48 years that I had. Mm-hmm. Nobody else had the conglomeration of things that yeah. I had. There are other people that had aortic dissections. There are other people that broke their leg. There's other people that are missionaries, mm-hmm. but nobody had the 48 year span that I had. That's mm-hmm. absolutely right. It's mm-hmm. a personal story. Yeah. Whether it's, um, you know, I always felt like I, so I wanted to be, um, if have you heard of the women of faith conferences back in the, the day, it was in 98 when I went. So it's the big, big women went in a, in a big, uh, stadium and spoke and did this like conference. And that's what I wanted to do. I didn't know why. And I didn't have a story. I'm like, I don't have anything worth telling or talking yeah. about. Mm. Like, oh my, they're not going to listen to me. Yeah. But we all have a story. And so that was my, probably my biggest realization is that we are all special we're all unique god made us all as individuals we hear that all the time as kids right and yep, right. Mm-hmm. we all have unique gifts that he's given us we all have the unique story so i may be a women's coach but i'm not going to reach people the way jenny and tyra would mm-hmm. certainly right? true we all, mm-hmm. have, we all have a unique story we all have unique skills and we're going to resonate with different people and that's there's yeah. plenty of people out there that need each of our services. If we yeah, don't yeah. do it, there's other people that will, but they're not going to do it the same way. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. it is true. Because everybody's, like you said, everybody's story is different. Everybody's experience is different. Maybe it could be, depending on the story, it could be kind of relatable and kind of familiar familiar situations. It, you know, depending on the situation, you know, yeah. but, you know, Everyone has a purpose. You know, we all have to go through certain things in our life to be able to walk in our identity and figure out who we were, who who we are, you know, for our future selves. Like it took you to like sit down, like because of your situation and your surgery and and you were in a situation where you could have died. It took that for you to find your full blown purpose and now you're walking in it and and it it doesn't we don't have to be extraordinary we don't have to have a life ending process that you know Mm -hmm. knocks us over the head we Mm -hmm. just need to make the choice to think of things differently and see things differently and evaluate is this really what i want to do Mm, yeah Mm, yeah i like that and it doesn't even have to be life changing it could just be relationship changing or job changing or mm-hmm. physical change you know, if you take a moment to think about who you are and where you want to go in life you can make changes little ones and you'll get there mm-hmm. yeah and i certainly agree it just takes step by step and wanting that change yeah. um well sorry could you up jenny one thing um i noticed you were saying is when you were experiencing now, you didn't feel like you were fulfilling your purpose. I love that you're self-aware because I noticed that when most people go through crisis and they feel weird and I feel like your instinct, God gives you an intuition and you know it's time to move. Mm-hmm. And usually in a crisis, you don't know what to do. And I feel like people are so used to blaming themselves for feeling that way. So you're just like, I keep waking up, like something's not right. It seems like you're not grateful, but sometimes you just got to listen to that little voice in your head. You know, a lot of times, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we definitely I mean, I need think, to listen to that voice a lot more, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think we, I mean, so, I think we all deal with that, 
yeah. even if it's not a crisis, but I think we all go through that at some point in our lives. Like, okay, you know, I mean, I've done it. It's, I, I've done it. It's just the same way I walked in my purpose and, you know, empowering women, you know, and doing the podcast now. Yeah. I it, Believe me, I would have never right. thought I would be doing this, you know, six years later at all. You know, it just took my, it took one day where I'm praying to God, like, hey, you know, what is my purpose? And, and look at now, you know, so it kind of just, even like you speaking on that, just kind of just, it's just a reminder. Like yeah. you're giving me a reminder on what I'm doing now because, you know, I was in that place in life where, okay, I'm waking up every day and we know something that needs to be done. And you know, there's more to life than just the way we're, the way we're already living it. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I would encourage everybody listening to journal morning or night, mm -hmm. whenever you want to sit down, write it out. One, one, it gets the thoughts out of your head so you can sleep and you can you know, move yes. on. Yeah. But it helps mm -hmm. you process what's going on in your head. I feel like my, what's in between my ears is probably the biggest enemy I have. Mm, when I process and think so through things on my own, it's horrible. I need to talk mm. it out, write it out. And I love journaling to get it out of my head. And because I will write things down that I don't even know are in there. And it helps yeah. me process what's going on. Yes, I was going to say that. I Okay, so I have this weird obsession with sometimes, not all the time, because sometimes you don't need to know, but reading old old entries. And sometimes you can see the progression or you can notice like, wow, I don't even speak like that anymore. I yeah. don't do these things mm -hmm. anymore. And it just kind of gives you that boost of you know energy. So it's so nice to see. It's like, wow. So I, I got stress out that night. Like you said, I was able to go to sleep. And then I'm also looking at how much I've grown. Yeah. Yeah. From See, that totally. time in my life. So I, I recommend journaling 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say that my favorite is the five minute journal. It takes you five minutes in the morning and five minutes in the evening to process and get ready for the day and to close out the day. And, and mm, it includes gratitude like and, uh, I and definitely evaluation. Yeah, try that. I, I promise you, you would like it. Hmm, five minutes. Hmm, I like that. I've never yeah. usually I just journal, you know, just take time out of my day just to journal. Yeah. yeah. And I could be sitting there for 20 minutes, but the five minutes, I definitely would like yeah, to try yeah. that. I see. <laughs> yeah, it, it um I don't know if it's on Amazon or not. I found it somewhere else, but it's just taking a few moments in the morning to what are your highlights? What are the things you really need to make sure you get done today? Okay. And in, in the evening, did you do it? And what are you grateful yeah. for? What was your win? Yeah. That sounds pretty neat. Yeah. So looking back at your life as a whole, what is the most memorable time of your life? And there's so much in, in 50 years. <laughs> I mean, I was <laughs> sorry. You have to pick no. one. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, what comes to mind is just being a missionary and being able to travel and do the Lord's work and, and be a, a vessel to help and guide people. Um, I, I love being able to have conversations that help somebody move the, the needle in their life. Um, and as a missionary wife, I could do that. And I was, um, an aide and teacher and whatnot at the school. So I got different roles and I got to, I got to practice and try my hand out at different things because I, I couldn't hold my, a job myself because we were missionaries, yeah. but with yeah. the school, I got to try things and see what I like to do. Mm. And, it's, and that's, I think that's what we all need is just to have a, a have time where we can try things, whether they're mm -hmm. side hustles or hobbies yeah. or full-time jobs, try things. You don't know what you'll like if you don't try it. Yeah, so I certainly you, right? agree. It just takes, a, take, take that step. That's all it takes. And is there, is you can, can you give like any advice to anyone that a woman that is going through that is a midlife wife or anyone that man or woman or young person that's going through a midlife crisis. Can you give them any advice on what they can do or how to go about it? I, my book's great, but um, you think of where you're at. What is it? Where are you at in life? And, and you think about where you are in different areas. So you're, you think about your personal and your emotional and your spiritual and physical and all the different places you're at where do you want to be mm -hmm. six months 12 months 
three years, however far out you can imagine. And think of that life in its physical form. Picture it, mm. feel it, taste it. What would it be like living in the house that you want to have? What would it be like looking in the bank account after you get the, the paycheck that you want to receive? What does it feel like and what would you do? How would you celebrate? What would that look like for you? And when you can picture that and put it into sentences that are affirmative and present day, your mind will help you bring that to pass. Don't say I'm going to, or I will, or I want to, or I wish I'm going to have this. Say mm -hmm. I live at this address, or I live in a four bedroom home. And for me, one of my big things is I want one of those curved monitors that are you know two monitors wide. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly. That's, what you mean. that's one of my statements is, is I'm working at my desk with my curved oh. monitor. It's a Samsung 49 inch curved monitor. And that those nice. kind of positive, <laughs> specific statements will help you bring that to pass. Hmm. I um, agree. I agree. I like that. I think you got to talk to yourself nice. You know, I always, I saw this one quote. It was, it said, uh, treat yourself how you treat someone you love. And it's so crazy because you would think your daughter, your husband, your family, but like, you love yourself too. You have to love yourself the most because, mm -hmm. you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. You so. can't. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is to help ladies understand that they have to take care of themselves. We yes. are, mm -hmm. we can take care of others, but wouldn't it be so much better if we have a full cup and we can give of the overflow and we can take care of them even better because we've taken care of ourselves. Yes. Absolutely. So that comes to our next, uh, can you speak on your business and what you do for women and in the community? <laughs> yeah. So I am a women's coach. I help ladies find their identity and purpose and work on living that dream. So working on what does that dream look like? And then helping them get, take the steps to bring it to pass. It is, it's not putting the family aside, but it's taking care of us so that we can better take care of the family. Absolutely. So that's my, my role as a coach. I also am working with an organization called Achieve Systems to help other business owners build their business. And so we get together every couple months for mixers and conferences and mastermind calls and just am helping everybody be the best version of themselves in whatever area that is. That's amazing. Where can we find you? So Facebook is Noelle L. Peterson. And that's my, my business page. You'll find you everything else. Um, my website is add value to life dot, uh, dot com and slash women will get you to my page. Um, add value to life dot com itself goes to my husband, who is a business coach as well. Yes, that's, that's awesome. Amazing. I love a power couple. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. You know, when, and it's also important to have someone that stands by you when you're going through anything and to hold your hand. Because I think that's important too. Uh, you know, even when you're going through your mid life your midlife crisis, I mean, you need the support even yeah. when you're single too. Life was not meant to be done alone. No, nope, not at all. Not at all. Well, I I'm fortunate that you were divorced at a young age, so that you can <laughs> be with this business coach because he sounds like he adds great value to your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it's part of my story. It may not have been something I'm yeah. proud of, but it's it's who I am, and it brought me to here. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't resist through that moment because look at you now, you know. Right. And I don't think that if, I mean, clearly, if you were separated that young, that isn't the person that would make you who you are today. Hundred percent, two hundred percent. Yeah. I'm going to go check for open questions, um, see if we have any comments from the audience. Um, no one has said anything. Okay, that's fine. I will be definitely reaching out to you, Noelle. All right. <laughs> and what is your book called, by the way? My book is called The Dream Life Planner. From There's a subtitle of From Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered. So it is a mini book on Amazon, 52 pages. 
Don't buy it on Audible. It won't do you any good. You need to have pen and paper to write down. I lost you at the overwhelmed that we had a bad connection there. Oh, bummer. From tired and overwhelmed to free yes. and empowered. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. It, and does it say Noel Peterson? It does. Noel okay. L. Peterson. Um, it's a mini itty bitty book, 52 pages, and it's not any good on Audible because you have to write in it. Okay. Mm. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you so much, Noel, uh, oh, for, <laughs> for your story and your testimony. And I hope anyone that was, was listening this evening, woman, man, uh, anyone that's young or in a relationship, listen to this, uh, had listened to her story because midlife crisis can come in any age. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's, and, and I love this topic because it's, it's not spoken about often at all. So, and I love that you were able to come on and speak about it. And thank you again. Um, and we have a question. We always ask all our guest speakers, what makes you uncommon? I, we're all uncommon. Yes. I will tell a story if I can real quick. When we were going through marriage counseling, my, the husband was getting frustrated because I didn't have common sense. The, the mm. counselor told him it wasn't that I had Robert sense. Oh, okay. Common sense is common to you. It's not necessarily common to the everybody. So common to you, not common to everybody. Mm -hmm. I said I've I've got I've been a missionary. I've been a pastor wife. I've um, worked for the government, and I've had a life saving surgery. I am saved by their yeah. savior, who left me here to do something. I am a woman of influence, trying to help women find their purpose. You are a powerful woman. Thank you for what you do. I love that. I love that. I do. I do. And honestly, guys, if there's anyone else out there like Noel, please tune in with us. Email us at uncommonwomanpodcast at gmail.com. We are going to start commercials. Um, we are obviously dedicated to women, but um, we want to start showing more love to businesses, especially as things start to happen for us and all these great changes that we don't want to really speak on, but we're going to do commercials. We do promotions. Please feel free. And if you know anyone or you yourself wants to be a guest speaker, email us as well. Um, we love doing this. This is something that we are probably going to do forever. <laughs> um, so please just tune in with us. And every Monday, I'll be doing Motivational Mondays. Um, every day, guys, I think about like how I can expand and do something nice and new for you guys so please just continue to follow us on this journey um it's gonna be a good one and make sure you tune in for next week's uh episode yes. another powerful testimony and stay on common thanks guys bye we hope you enjoyed today's episode if you've been shacking up with us for a while and haven't subscribed to our channel what are you waiting for? Please like and subscribe to Uncommon Woman so you won't miss another episode. And remember, don't let anything or anyone affect your peace. Good vibes and stay uncommon.